life. Welcome to Coffee and Real Talk for Writers, where we get real about the writing life. Writing might be a solitary activity, but becoming a successful author is anything but. So grab a cuppa, pull up a chair, and let's talk. Hello, and welcome to Episode 6 of Coffee and Real Talk for Writers. I'm your host, Talina Winters, and I'm recording this on Friday, February 4, 2022. First off, if you were expecting this to be waiting for you when you woke up this morning, I'm sorry. This week has been, um, it was, it's been difficult for me just the last few days. The week started out okay, but I think I'm struggling with some mild depression, which isn't common for me though it does happen on occasion. Anyways, I haven't figured out the cause, and since depression isn't chronic for me, there usually is a reason. Um, I'm not really sure what the reason is. In this case, I suspect it is actually a combination of lack of sleep, burnout recovery, seasonal depression. There's been so many cold gray days lately, and it's snowing in gray again today. And also pandemic fa- fatigue. Um, I'm feeling cooped up in my house. It's the beginning of February. I haven't really been out to speak of in weeks. And yeah, I am going out this weekend and I'm thankful for that. I'm going to go see my grandmother and my mom. Um, and I think that'll help. Anyways, in addition, a couple mornings ago, I figured out that another author that I knew primarily online must have died. Uh, last year. I came across a DM I'd sent her on Twitter last August asking how she was because I was attending the When Words Collide conference online at the time and I noticed that she wasn't present, which I'd met her the year before there and ever since she'd been fairly active on Twitter as a connector and she wasn't there. And I was like, hmm. So I sent her a text that day, um, but I don't spend a lot of time on Twitter. And so I actually didn't notice until Wednesday morning that she had never replied. And then I went looking to see when the last time she was active and she hadn't been active since May of last year. And then I actually went searching around the internet to see if I could find her or find another way to connect with her or figure out what had happened. Her website was just going to a landing page with Japanese on it now. And, um... Her Twitter account still exists, but again, no activity since last May. And yeah, my only conclusion at that point was that she must have died. And I didn't know her well, but the news did hit me kind of hard. And I think, like I was already not feeling great that day, but that really didn't help. And I think it's because she's about my age and she's either been doing this longer than me or is more prolific than me because she has way more books out. And um, in her way, she was really contributing to the community by connecting writers on Twitter. And I haven't heard anybody talk to her or about what happened to her, which just seems a little bit sad to me that she was, she just kind of faded away and no one really noticed for like a year. But I just wanted to say that I remember her. Her name is Pamela Kenny. Um, And I really hope she's not dead, that she's out there alive somewhere. And I just has just decided to pull away from <clears throat> online life, but that doesn't seem likely. Um, and thinking about Pamela and what may or may not have happened to her has also kind of reminded me of my own mortality in a way that um, even though we've been kind of surrounded by reminders of death and mortality a lot more in the last few years, uh, this one just seemed more immediate, I guess. And I think partly just seeing how her business was kind of languishing, like her, her stores are still up on selling plat or sorry, her books are still again, (laughs) her books are still up on selling platforms, but, um, you know, like her website is gone and obviously no one's really maintaining her business in her stead, which I think is a little sad. Um, and so when I die, I hope that my business doesn't fade into oblivion like that and that my heirs have enough information available to them that they could continue to derive income from my business with only a little effort on their part. So a few weeks ago, I started a document that I facetiously, like I facetiously called exit strategy. <laughs> uh, it's not an exit strategy, which in case you're 
not familiar with the term, is what is typically re used to refer to when you're planning to sell your business. Like, sorry, not to sell your business, but say you're looking at a way to um, work yourself out of your business, essentially, to think of a way where you could then pass it on to someone else by selling it. Well, my business, my document's called Exit Strategy because chances are I'm not going to sell this business. I am the business. So <laughs> it's what would come into play if I was no longer able to produce the things that my business sells if that makes sense. Anyway, so what this document actually is, is the beginnings of a systems and procedure notebook um, that someone taking over from me would be able to use as a guide, whether because I died, or maybe I just got injured or sick, or maybe I'm just passing the business or parts of the business to someone else so that I can grow. Um, there's lots of reasons or uses a document like this could have. Well, I haven't gotten very far because the only thing that's in there right now are two apps that could immediately be unsubscribed to because <laughs> they're only useful to, to me in my process. So there's no point in someone taking over my business, continuing to pay that money. Uh, so the document isn't terribly useful just yet. It's not something I have a lot of time to devote to, but I really probably should take some time and just really spend a few hours and fill it out because... Even that, even a few hours of work going into it would probably make a huge difference for somebody taking over eventually. I do intend to add to it slowly over time as well, um, because I want to make sure that all the time and effort I've invested in creating this platform doesn't crumble into dust with me. And it's not so much about leaving a legacy of my own name and art out there. Um, that's not why I create, to be honest. And I know that that motivates some people and that's totally fine. It's just not my motivation. Um, but I do want to make sure that the time that I've taken away from my loved ones to build this, which was supposed to be an investment for their future, that it's still an investment for their future, even if I'm no longer able to be there so that it would, it's something that can continue to benefit them as time goes on. That was kind of my low for the week, and I'm sorry for starting with that, but now let's get on to some highs. Um, it, I'm warning you in advance. As I said, I'm, I've been a little down, so, you know, it's still kind of a mixed bag as far as highs, but I did have some good, good highs. Uh, one of them was, I think it was Tuesday morning I woke up and saw that someone had left a really wonderful five-star review for my book, Finding Heaven, um, but it was nice to not only read that and get a little boost and reminder of like, oh yeah, this is why I do this. At least one of the reasons I told you it's not forgetting my, leaving my name out there. M my motivation is primarily helping, helping other people. Um, so those kinds of reviews really are a boost for me when people read them and they're, they're talking about ways that they benefited because they read my work. Um, but it was also nice to share. So I actually did just make a little graphic and put that up on Instagram this week. And actually it was fun. Even just the creativity of creating the graphic was fun. By the way, side note, um, this is, wasn't in my notes, but uh, I discovered that I don't really care for Canva for creating that kind of a graphic. And I don't care for a book brush for creating that kind of a graphic because the tools were just so frustrating to use. I had kind of a vision in mind of what I wanted to do but I was limited on Canva by um, the lack of the ability to make a 3D book cover. And I could have imported, and in fact did, I, I downloaded a 3D book cover of a paperback book of Finding Heaven from BookBrush, and I imported it into Canva, which is a lot of steps and seems a little ridiculous. But then I wasn't able, like I'm not familiar enough with Canva's tools to do this, and that might just be the problem. Um, but it was supposed to be a, a time saver for me, and it wasn't. In the end, frustrated, I just went back to Photoshop and made it myself from scratch because I'm very familiar with Photoshop. And even though um, that program has a huge learning curve when you start out, I've put in the time for that learning curve. And so now the tools are very easy for me to use. And so I just did that. Plus, you can do way more with it than you can with Canva, etc. So as I was doing it, though, I was thinking, you know, one of the primary advantages of um Canva is that it has all these great templates. And I did actually, I confess, I was looking at some of their templates while I was creating my little graphic just for ideas, but I ended up going with something way simpler than anything that they had. And it was exactly what I wanted. 
And the point is um, that I'm like, well, I can make templates myself. I can, I can have some templates and just have a little library of templates that when I'm wanting to post something like this, I just go and I grab, you know, look and see what I've got. And I just grab something. And I think that's what I'm going to do. It probably won't be something I sit down and make a bunch of templates for, but just over time, as I create things, I'll just also then save a, a file into a folder called templates so that next time I can just go grab one of those if I'm in a hurry. So, um, I guess that's, a time-saving hack if you're frustrated by the tools that are available that are supposed to be saving you time but aren't find ways to make the tools that you are already familiar with save you more time anyways okay back to my notes um i had a very productive monday it was very full i was i filled out an interview form for a blog that i was invited to appear on and then i also completed uh i i mentioned that i'm converting some of my knitting patterns from my for my knitwear design business into um screen reader accessible versions for low vision knitters. So I completed another one of those on Monday and notified the past purchasers that they could get the new version. And on Tuesday, I did some, I got some words down in my manuscript. Right now um, I'm, I'm writing a sweet romance called Every Star That Shines. And I got some words down, but I, at least half of my writing time that day was actually spent on research. And this was kind of fun because I got to watch my watch my first Punch and Judy show, which I watched on YouTube. So here's the reason why I'm watching Punch and Judy for my manuscript. So in the manuscript, my heroine is directing a kid's musical. And figuring out which musical the kids were putting on was a real struggle for me when I was outlining because it can't be a copyrighted work. Um, because of, you know, I knew that I would probably be referring to specific things about it and I just didn't want to put myself in a legal position that would cause me trouble later. Um, I really wanted to use Pinocchio because of the star theme so that I could refer to the When You Wish Upon a Star song. But with Disney being one of the most litigious companies in the history of history, and with referring to anything but a song's title in a novel requiring a license, I tried to find another way because I have actually tried to get a license to use a Disney owned song for something else in the past. It was a kind of a nightmare, even though they have a website that lets you do it. I just, I gave up. It was too much work for what I was wanting to do. And I just didn't want to bother. So I decided what I would do is I would go read the source material, which is the book, The Adventures of Pinocchio by Carlo Collati. And to see, just to see if the star theme was also in there and if I could use it, use the star theme without referring to the Disney musical, which is, which would be fine because the adventures of Pinocchio is hundreds of years old and definitely out of copyright. Okay. It's in the public domain. So the star theme was kind of in there. Um, it was enough in there that I was like, Hmm. So I also did a bunch of research on the various adaptations of Pinocchio, which I'm going to get into in a minute. But first of all, I want to talk about the book Pinocchio because it's a weird book. <laughs> okay. I have to say I did not really care for it at all. Um, Disney did a real, a lot of really smart things with that story when they turned it into a movie because <laughs> man, it's just like, it's episodic, uh, which makes the story feel really random. Like it does come back around on a few of the important points, but like by about a third of the way through, I was just like, this is the book that defines pantsing a book. I was just like, how are these things even related to each other? It was just, it was so weird. And I was like basically live texting my mastermind group on Slack while I was reading through it. And like the general tone of each comment was just like, I was rolling my eyes so hard. I just saw my brain, right? Like, it was just like, oh my gosh, you guys, like, you, I can't believe this is in here. And I was like sending screenshots like look at this anyways I don't know um so one of the points one of the things is that the the main theme and lesson are all rolled into one of the book and it's that foolish children who disobey their parents come to great heartache and ruin and cause the same for their parents and I mean it wasn't just a subtle theme I'm very very good with stories having themes and moral lessons like I think that makes a story have heart and matter. Okay. So those are good things. 
But this one was just like pounded into the reader in every chapter and right to the very last line. It was crazy. So yay for consistency for a pantsed book. That part was really strong. But I feel really sorry for the poor Victorian kids who got entertained by such moralizing. I mean, a little, a little subtlety, please, right? Um, but probably the worst part is that Pinocchio himself as a character was really, really unlikable for most of the book. And so I think what they did with the Disney version and making him this just he's just kind of naive and innocent. I mean, he does a lot of stupid things, but it's because he's naive and innocent and just really gullible. That was good. And that was actually in the book. But um, in the book, he was also just a real spoiled brat and really, really selfish. And so it was hard to root for him. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Anyways, fortunately, the book wasn't very long and I was kind of skimming it anyway. And so I did get through it in only a few hours. It's not like I spent a lot of my time on it. Um, and then I went and I spent a bunch of time looking at the adaptations that had been done and who owned them and, and the ideas from the book that had been used and how they'd been adapted. And I love Wikipedia for stuff like this. It's fantastic. Um, it's been adapted a really surprising number of times. Um, and in both Italian, which was the original language and in English, and some of them have been recently, um, so one of my mastermind group actually suggested that I could write my own adaptation. And I say write in air quotes there because not to actually write out the whole thing, but to create my own story that I could use for my book to avoid the copyright issues. Um, so I balked at this at first because it seemed like too much work and uh, more work than I wanted to do anyways. And I'm like, like, I'm already writing a book. Now I have to write a musical that would go in the book. Uh, but then I got an idea for what my adaptation could be like and how it could work to support my novel's theme. So actually I spent an entire writing day outlining the musical, coming up with song names, and casting some of the major roles from my novel's cast into the play. And it was really fun. And then I got to the end and I'm like, okay, I actually want to write this now. Um, so, you know, I'll just add it to my list, my very, very long list of projects to do. Uh, I never actually imagined that I would ever want to adapt a fairy tale of any kind, but especially Pinocchio, which is not one of my more favorite fairy tales. The only reason I was really interested for this book is because of the star theme. Um, but yeah, I'm like, I don't know, maybe it sounds fun actually. So, um, yeah, I have, I guess, technically the first musical I did, I wrote was an adaptation as well. It's an adaptation of the story of Esther from the Bible. And that didn't really occur to me until today. For the most part, all of my work has been original. And so I guess, you know, like ad adapting a fairy tale wouldn't be so bad. But I don't know if I'd ever adapt a fairy tale for as a, as a novel. I know fairy tale adaptations are, are a whole genre. And I've read some long time ago, which I really, really loved. Um, so I don't know, maybe I need to read some of the modern ones and see if I can see if it's something I could see myself doing, but I've got plenty to do right now. So that'll happen later anyway. And also I have a book to finish first that I'm already working on anyway. Um, so the reason why I'm back to, back to punch and Judy. So anyway, in the original book, when Pinocchio gets caught up with the puppet master, which you may remember from the Disney movie, uh, some of the puppets in the production, that the puppet master runs is uh, that he has Punch and Judy in there. Now I've been aware of Punch and Judy for a while, of course. And if you're not familiar with them, they are actually some characters that go back to like, I think the 1600s. I didn't go double check this just before I recorded. So if I'm wrong, you know, I'm wrong, but they are hundreds of years old. They actually, the original character was an Italian character called Pulcinella uh, or Pulcinello or something like that which eventually evolved into Punchinello, um, which that name is familiar to me because Max Lucado has some children's board books and children's books about Punchinello, which I, I had one or two of those I read to my kids when they were little. Um, and then that character, Punchinello, eventually became the British Punch and Judy, which are typically, they're, they're like, they're, puppet, they're a puppet play that's typically performed at 
the seaside. And I don't know why the association with the seaside, other than that people go to seaside towns to, like, th those, are, those are tourist towns. So I think that's probably why. Um, and so they would have these little puppet stands set up on the street and have these plays. And for the last several hundred years, like, the general themes and stories within the Punch and Judy plays have all kind of been the same, um, the characters, etc. They have changed over time as these things do, but there's been a lot of things that have just carried on and on. And one of the key things about Punch, too, is that um, he has, uh, like, the, the performer keeps a little something in their mouth called a swazzle that changes his voice, so it's really squeaky and annoying. And he always says, that's the way to do it! Um, and so there's, like, these key things that have stayed with the character, which are fun, but some of the things you may not have thought of before is that the, our words punchline come from Punch and Judy as well as slapstick because Punch always had a slapstick. He would go around. He's a very violent character and he goes around beating people with his slapstick to make people laugh. So anyway, <laughs> that's your little history lesson about Punch and Judy for the day. Um, so because Punch and Judy were some of the puppets in the book and I thought it would be really fun to introduce, because I just, I love history as you probably know. Um, so to, to introduce some of this history into this kid's play, this musical, and cats are definitely out of copyright and some people would even recognize them. I thought, I'm going to definitely have a Punch and Judy in my um, Pinocchio play and they're going to be actually important to my novel so that they can be present because, I mean, there's going to be lots of characters from that would be in the actual musical that probably won't ever get mentioned in my novel, okay? <laughs> so, um... And because of that, like one of my novel's characters is a teenage girl whose cast is Judy and her mom is having a major conflict with my heroine. So I needed to write a scene where I had Punch and Judy rehearsing to lead into this main conflict of my scene. And so in order to do that, I needed to know, know more about Punch and Judy than I'd could read on YouTube. So I went on, sorry, then I could read on Wikipedia. So I went on YouTube and unfortunately found this wonderful um, half hour production that had been recorded in Brighton, England a few years ago. It was so cute. Um, and I just laughed, <laughs> even though it's definitely for kids. I just, it was a really interesting way, form of entertainment. So yeah, if you're curious about Punch and Judy, go look them up on YouTube. There was more than one available, but probably the one that I found um, is going to be top of your search results as well. And um, yeah, it was really, really cute. So the other thing, fun thing I'm looking forward to researching, and maybe that I'll do it this weekend. Um is that I've also incorporated as part of the plot the story of Anna Leah Nowens, whom you might recognize that name if you've seen either The King and I or Anna and the King, the movie with Jodie Foster that was made in 1999. Um, so I'll get to why she's in there in a second, but uh, while researching her, I found out some very interesting things about her history um, she wrote a memoir of her time in the court of Siam when she was a little later in life, I think. But she she was a Victorian woman who, who basically, if you're not familiar with the story, she got hired by the king of Siam uh, to come and teach his wives and children a secular British education because he wanted to modernize his world and his country and make sure that there was a place for Siam in the world. And... So she did. I mean, he had like uh, 30 wives and concubines, 30 something, and then like 89 kids. So it wasn't a small job. She went and she did this. And so there's actually a lot of things about her to admire because she was a widow. Um, she took her young son with her. She sent her daughter back to England for boarding school at the time, but she took her young son with her. And she was constantly standing up to the king for the things that she wanted and expected, expected but she had a lot to learn as well. And I haven't actually seen, and uh, sorry, I haven't seen The King and I yet, which is crazy because I've seen so many Rodgers and Hammerstein musicals. I can't believe I haven't seen this one. I'm familiar with a few of the major songs, but I've never seen the actual play. Um, but I did watch Anna and the King and I really enjoyed it. Um, so this occurred to me to have this in there because I was looking for a role that my heroine's grandmother could have played that she would find admirable as like a strong woman who and somebody 
that because she kind of idolizes her grandmother, who was also an actress. So then I started looking into Anna Leah no Noens. I'm having a hard time saying that name. Anna Leah Noens. Anyways, I read about her on you on Wikipedia. I don't know why I keep mixing that name up with YouTube this week. Anyway, <laughs> and discovered, I mean, so many interesting things about her. And one of the most interesting things that worked perfectly for my story is that she actually falsified her memoirs. So the memoirs she wrote, and then they became wildly popular in Victorian England. And then later in the early 20th century, the memoir was novelized by, oh, I forget the name. I think it was Margaret Lawson. You guys, I really should check these things before I <laughs> record, but I, I didn't. I'm sorry. Um, and then that novelization was what was adapted into the musical and then also a couple of movies over the 20th century of her story. And there were things about her life, like like by the time those adaptations had happened, um, it still wasn't clear what parts of her memoir had been falsified. Um, but like one of the most basic ones was her origin. She told everyone she was from Wales, Cardiff, Wales, but she had never, I don't even know she'd ever been there. Um, she was actually born in India and spent most of her upbringing in India. So there were reasons for her to do it, but... Uh, and she was trying to promote an, her, the station of herself and her children um, to help them out and hide. Uh, she was actually part Asian Indian. And so, like, she was trying to navigate the society she was in. But <laughs> the fact that she falsified them, and even to this day, there's still a lot of controversy over the way she portrayed the King of Siam and and those things. It's just like, it was really interesting and actually fit really, really well into the theme of my book, which is talking about how you don't really know what's happening in somebody's life behind closed doors. Um, things aren't always what they seem and you shouldn't be so quick to judge people and execute judgment on them, I guess. Um, I haven't really thought out that whole theme in so many words before, so that was a little rough, but I'll work on it. Anyway, so I just thought it was so perfect because I had landed on this story and then I started doing the research. And then after doing the research, decide, discovered how perfectly this story fits in with the theme of my novel. And this isn't the first time that something like this has happened to me. So I actually have a rule of thumb. I, I've told you before that I'm mostly an outliner now and I, I do outline on a high level. But when I'm in the scene and writing the scene, I'm still a discovery writer. I, if, if something occurs to me that isn't what I expected and isn't what I planned for, I have a kind of rule of thumb for myself that if I can't think of a compelling reason within about five seconds why that shouldn't be in my book, I generally just keep it and I just work around whatever complications it introduces. And th that, and as I said, quite often, it just makes the story so much richer and it usually supports the thing that I'm trying to say in the book. And I may not even have known why at the time, but either it's divine inspiration, which I totally believe is a thing, um, or my subconscious maybe had glommed onto something in there that uh, consciously I hadn't really recognized yet. And that's why my books usually have some like really delightful twists in them and some depth to them that maybe they wouldn't have if I had just stuck to my outline, which is kind of a, like, it's more of a superficial, I'm hitting on the conflict and plot beats kind of thing, but it doesn't have the depth of exploring, like, how Anna Leah Owens uh, navigated her life by um, lying about it, essentially. So, hmm. It's a little bit like doing improv. Uh, like the rule in improv is that you never say no to something that another actor does or suggests. You just always say yes and, which is often what happens while I'm writing. And that's how my books end up being what they are. Okay, so for the next, uh, th the last thing I want to talk about today um, is something in a completely different direction. It's something I thought of a few days ago. And I just wanted to chat with you. And that's the hidden value of any collaborator you work with and what they bring to the table. 
And this is a bit of a kind of a, I don't know. It's not woo woo. It's, I don't know. I, I, let me just explain. I'll just go through and explain. Hopefully it makes sense when I'm done. So this hidden value I'm talking about is not a value they put on their business card. It's not something you'll see on their website. And well, not really. You kind of can if you are looking for the right things. Um, it's something you actually have to ascertain through your own research and the hidden value you bring to the table. And that value is the network and the networking ability of the collaborator. So let me explain that. In writing, as in so many industries, your success can be helped along by who you know. The value in a prestigious school isn't usually so much the higher than average quality of the teaching, which may or may not exist. And it probably does, let's be honest, because of how well-funded the school probably is because of the people who go there. Um, but that's not what happened right away, right? So it's, it's the people that you get to know when you go there that actually give it its value. Um, schools like Harvard and Yale in the United States are prestigious schools because the people who go there usually end up becoming movers and shakers in politics and and civil life and things like that. And they all know each other so because they went to school with each other. So those relationships actually matter for the rest of their lives. For, for me, um, if I had gone to the Juilliard School of Music instead of Red Deer College, I could have been taught directly by songwriting legend Pat Patterson, who is like, yeah, amazing. I did actually take an online course of his once through Coursera, which was fantastic. Um, and I would take more of his and I've read his, uh, one of his books. But if I'd sat in his class, that would have been different. Um, or I could have been mentored by Stephen Schwartz, who is the writer of Wicked and The Prince of Egypt, uh, the music in The Prince of Egypt. So, and the musical Wicked, by the way, just to clarify, the book was written by uh, Gregory McGuire. So if I'd gone to school there, I've also, I would also have been with other, other budding musical theater writers, and uh, some of whom would have gone on to pursue a career in musical theater and who have, may have been the exact collaborator that it would have helped me toward my own goals. And I would have also been helping them. But Chances are that our goals would have been much more closely aligned than the people that I did go to school with. Not necessarily, but I didn't go to a musical theater program. It was a more general program and had several general programs in a very small arts department. Now, it was wonderful, and I don't really regret the choice I made. Um, I wouldn't give up the connections and I made there and the lessons I learned for anything. Um, and that has still defined many things that happened in my life, which I love about my life. But did that choice to go to, to my local college limit my future options? Well, in some ways, yes. And had I known how important those connections were for determining your, my future, I may have chosen my college differently. I don't know. I probably still wouldn't have ended up at Juilliard, which is a long ways and very away from where I, I live and it's in a different country, but who knows? Maybe I would have. I do know some people who went on to Juilliard and, you know, so I guess in a way I could benefit from their connections if I really wanted to. Uh, anyways, my point is the network we have can make such a huge difference in our careers. And that's why as writers, um, having that author network is so important. Your network not only supports you and encourages you and helps you along, but if they believe in you and your work, they will amplify your influence by telling others about you. Your voice alone talking about your books is never going to make you a best-selling author. That's why you need that network. Now, I know this isn't a foreign concept because that's what social media influences are, professional networkers. That's what reviewers are essentially. When, we, when somebody leaves a review, they're amplifying your influence by telling other people about you. I mean, we get it, right? We're, we're constantly looking for ways to amplify our network. But I'm going to go back to my original point that when you hire someone to work with you, you have the potential to broaden your network in an exponential way beyond the value 
the obvious value that that person is bringing. So this will not be the case with every collaborator you hire, just so you know. And just so you know, when I'm talking about collaborators right now, I'm talking about editors, cover designers, maybe even virtual assistants, um, definitely marketers and publicists if you hire those. But basically the people that you hire in order to help you build your business. So some of the value these people bring to the table is their network and whether they are good at connecting people within it. Now, their ability to network and the network that they already have should not be the major decision-making factor about whether to hire someone or not. Okay, you definitely want to think about other things first. But you shouldn't ignore it either. Most writers think about price first. But what you really ought to be thinking about is value. So the obvious value that you're hiring for is how much skill and experience does this person bring to the table? Will I be happy with their product or service when we're done? And that is definitely what should be the most influential factor in your decision. More than price, in my opinion. Yes, you do need to work within your budget, but always hire the best collaborator you can afford because um, otherwise you probably will regret it at some point. When I was on that uh, round table with Mark Leslie Lefebvre and his patrons a a couple weeks ago, one of the other people there was Julie Strauss, who is also a podcaster, where she talks about um, people's best or favorite novels on the podcast, Best Book Ever, if you wanted to check that out. Anyways, we were talking about um, hiring somebody at professional rates when you hire an editor. And I believe it was Julie that said, if you hire quality, you only cry once. It was something like that. And I couldn't agree more. You definitely want to hire the best um, professional you can afford who, who fits well with you as far as how you can work together. But besides that obvious value of their skills and experience, the hidden value is what kind of network does this person have? Are they connected to others who may be enjoy or benefit from my work? Or who may be a good collaborator for me to network with? Are they a connector themselves who will tell others about me and who will connect me with others that would be assets to my own network? And it sounds kind of cutthroat when you say it like that, and that absolutely can't be how you approach it. You can never approach networking with a what's in it for me attitude and expect to be successful because people can sense that self-serving attitude and will want nothing to do with you. You So basically what you should do is approach it with, what do I have to offer? How can I help you? But be aware of this hidden value when you are making decisions about whom to hire, because your editors, cover designers, and virtual assistants will all have a vested interest in the success of your book and your career to a degree. They'll want it to succeed so their own work becomes more widely known, but also so that they can retain, retain you as a client, which means that If you have a brand and product that they can endorse, they will. They'll retweet your tweets about it. They'll tell their friends about it. They'll become an advocate for you. Now, this hidden value may not always be obvious when you first hire someone. And it's often something that can develop over time. So be aware of that, even if you're hiring somebody who doesn't look like they have a huge um, network already. That doesn't mean that they won't create one. And you're going to be part of it, obviously. One of my first editing clients uh, was Jessica Renwick, who is a fantastic author, middle grade fantasy and sweet romance. Um, I definitely recommend you check out her work. But not only has she become one of my best author friends, but she is also a tremendous advocate for my career. And I'm also for hers, as you probably just heard. I love recommending her work because they're some of my favorite books. And I just get so excited when I get to work on one of her projects. Um, So we believe in each other's books and we're using our connections to help each other because that's what friends do, um, but it's also what professional colleagues do. The truth is, as long as I believe in a client's work and believe that it would benefit my own audience, I will advocate for it, which isn't something I would ever advertise or charge for. You're not gonna see that on my website. But many people in my network of collaborators have also done the same for me, 
which means that it's also important to pay attention to the hidden value that you bring to the table. And the best way to do that is by being kind and helpful and getting to know others in the community. Spread the word about others' work without expecting anything in, back, in response. Connect with other authors and be someone that people are happy to know. Eventually, all of that mutual kindness is a hidden value that adds up to some not so hidden rewards. All right, so my mug quote of the week is be the kind of person you want to meet. And starting this week, I'm going to ask a question of the week and see what happens. Um, I would really love for this to be more of a conversation. And I know that there's a few people out there listening, and I really appreciate those of you who have reached out to me and told me that you're enjoying the podcast. That means so much. Um, I had, I discovered after a podcast, I started podcasting how weird it is to be a podcaster and how hard it is to get that feedback. And I can now now understand why so many of the podcasters I know have started like Facebook groups or, you know, different things to try and develop that community. And I haven't quite decided how I'm going to handle this because the truth is that um, it's hard to leave a comment on a podcast. And even if you happen to remember to try it can still be hard. I have tried to leave comments on podcasts recently because I'm understanding now how hard it is to get feedback on on your posts and your episodes, I should say. So I've gone and I've tried to, to leave comments and it has just been such a runaround that I've eventually given up sometimes because some platforms make it really, really difficult. So all that to say, I'm asking question of the week which is this, how have you seen the hidden value you and others bring to the table pay off in your career or in your life? I would love for you to um, tweet me at Talina Winters with your response, or you could uh, leave a comment on this podcast episode on my website at talinawinters.com slash podcast. And this one's going to be called The Hidden Value of Our Connections. It's season one, episode six. Um, so those are probably the two best ways to, to let me know what your answer to this question is for now. Uh, if you think that maybe a Facebook group or some other kind of way of connecting, I I'm trying to decide if maybe like a, uh, Kofi, like the coffee, buy me a coffee thing might work. I, I don't have a Patreon right now, but I'd consider opening it up if that was something that would actually develop community. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out what would work best for me, but also work best for people who are listening. So if you have suggestions, please throw them at me. I'd love to hear them. You can also email me, talina at talinawinters.com. And if you don't remember how to spell my name, look at your podcast app. It will be spelled correctly there, I promise. Um, anyway, so that was a weird way to end that, but I do hope that you have a great writing week week coming up and um thank you for bearing with all my stuttering and stammering today i don't know i'm just not as as fluent today as i normally am i guess um and yeah happy writing bye coffee and real talk for writers has been produced by tolina winters the music for this podcast was written by josh rickard of joshrickardmusic.com you can find episode show notes, leave a comment, subscribe, or if you're feeling generous, buy me a coffee at tolinawinters.com slash podcast. And be sure to leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice. Tell your friends to come by too. The kettle's always on. So until next time, I hope you keep writing and keep it real. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.